My guest has spent 30 years in ministry as a Salvation Army officer in Canada and France. She's now a Quebec and Atlantic Canada director of philanthropy for Opportunity International Canada. That's a lot of information, but I think many of you will know of Opportunity International, such a respected uh, outreach to those in countries where life is very difficult. Eleanor Shepard reflects deeply on issues of faith, and she writes about them in an award-winning way. Her latest book will prompt, I think, some fresh thinking, great conversation, and perhaps meaningful change in our relationships. More questions than answers. Sharing faith by listening. Eleanor, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you this day. Why do we need listening relationships? We've got a lot of communication going on. Notice I'm using my fingers. I have a bit of an attitude about it. Uh, you're taking us in another direction. Yeah, listening, I think, is probably one of the things that's most needed in our society. Uh, there is a great deal of loneliness, and the antidote to loneliness is not someone to come to talk to you. It's someone who can come and listen as you talk, as you share the things that you're thinking about, the things that are important to you. And it's when, we, when someone listens to us, we feel valued. We feel we we are of value to, per, to someone who is willing to listen to us. Isn't it said that's the greatest gift that you can it give is. anyone? It truly is. Is just being willing to listen. Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, hard sell in this culture though, isn't it, Eleanor? Uh, it's busy, it's noisy, there are so many modes of messaging, and you want some quiet. Yeah, but, but you can listen even in the midst of all of that. Um, you can take a few moments just to listen. Uh, one of my concerns is women in the age group from, let's say, uh, 25 to 60 even. Uh, many of them are very, very, very busy. Mm -hmm. And what they need most is someone just to take a few moments and say, how are things with you? Mm -hmm. Listen and then let them go on with their lives. It is such a help to people to know that, just, just to share where they are, what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, that is so profound. I will never forget the testimony of a young woman on a university campus mm -hmm. who visited all of the Christian communities. They all wanted her to go and do something. Go and evangelize, go and do this, reach out here, be a part of this activity. Someone said, how is joy? It shattered her mm -hmm. over time and God transformed her Amen. because she stopped to consider that question. Yeah. How's yeah. my heart before God? Exactly, yeah. yeah. This, this is really the core of your concern because so much of what we're messaging to our neighbors, our spiritually seeking friends, mm -hmm. isn't uh, connecting right. with what they're reaching for. Mm -hmm. Because so often we come across as people who have answers, and we do have answers, but people need to discover answers for themselves because of where they are on their journey. All of us are a different place in our journey, and the answers I need today are quite different than the answers I needed 15 years ago or even last week. And so we discover answers as we are able to articulate what's going on. And that's when we realize that God is so much a part of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I talk in the book about listening at two levels. And they we're listening at the level of the person we're speaking with or the person we are communing with or the person for whom we are creating a space where they can speak. Mm -hmm. But we're also listening at the level of the Spirit who is communicating with us at all times. He lives within us and He is the one who enables us to respond to others. Uh, you have a lovely term. A spiritual accompaniment. Yes. yes. Nothing to do with music. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's music just in being with people and just walking mm -hmm. with people. It just, you know, um, I love that term. Um, it actually, I think it translated from French. I was living in France when I was doing much of the writing of the book. And uh, so that's uh, where I think the term came to me from. It's the same thing as mm -hmm. the ministry of presence. Absolutely. Which is another beautiful phrase I love. Yeah. Now, a term you use that I really didn't like when I first met my husband, I have to just be honest about mm -hmm. this, he talked about his God concept. Mm -hmm. And I say, concept? That's my best friend you're talking about. He's not a concept. Uh, it, it sounds sterile and mm -hmm. cold mm -hmm. and non-relational. It sounds 
intellectual, uh, cerebral, but it's an important term. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I wonder in the news you're going to tell us about mm -hmm. February 2003, when your world was shattered in a phone call, mm -hmm. if your God concept was also shaken. Definitely so, definitely so. Um, I had actually, our son was traveling. Uh, we were living in Paris, in France, and um, our son was living, in, was in Boston studying, and he'd come to Montreal. He'd driven to Montreal for the weekend and was driving back to Boston on Sunday evening. And he had a car accident. And uh, I had been praying. We had actually traveled that weekend to Valence in the south of France to minister. All the way down on the train and all the way back, I was thinking of John driving this. Uh, it, I know the roads in Canada and the States in February are not wonderful. Mm -hmm. I was worried about that. I was praying the whole time. And then Monday morning, which was Sunday night in Canada, I got the phone call to say that there'd been an accident. It was your daughter who called? It was our daughter who called, yeah. And that uh, John was in the hospital in Vermont and he'd been paralyzed. So, yeah. And as I work through it, I'm thinking, I had asked God to care for John. I asked specifically. In fact, one of my prayers, interesting, one of my prayers on that uh, tr trip was I said, Lord, send your angels to watch over John. I don't usually ask the Lord to send angels, but I just, I guess the Spirit led me to pray that. When I got home and heard about the more details about the accident, I found out that the, the uh, border patrol saw the white vehicle overturned in the white snow Ooh. and they called the Vermont State Police who extracted John from the vehicle and got him to the hospital. He could have perished there. He would have had God not sent his angels and I believe that that Border Patrol were God's angels to John. There were a number of stirring things and I'm sure in the things we would never order you look mm -hmm. for God. Absolutely. Uh, you yeah. were praying when you got the phone call. I was. I was having my morning prayer time when the phone call came. And, uh, you know, you hear at 6 o'clock in the morning when the phone rings, you know that somebody in North America and you don't know what it's going to be. And, uh, yeah. You had just established a, 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 prayer, a prayer support, support group. This was marvelous because Glenn and I, um, Glenn, my husband, and I were responsible for the Salvation Army in France. And we were going through some really challenging times. The Army was going through some transitions, and it was a very challenging time for us. And people in Canada would say occasionally, yeah, well, can we pray for you, and that sort of thing. I said to Glenn one day, we, actually, we were driving down the highway, and she said, if we pulled out and got hit by a bus, that would be fine with me. I thought, we are in desperate straits here. Oh, dear. So I said, would you, like, yeah, would you like me to start a prayer support team and he said that would be a great idea so as folks in Canada emailed me I would write back and say would you like to be part of our prayer support team so we started the prayer support team and I do talk about this in the book and every we still have it supporting us and every the sixth of every month I send out our prayer requests and actually John was having the surgery to put the rod in his neck so he could come off the halo uh, after the accident, and the sixth was the sixth of February, and I'm friend lent me a computer, and I'm sending out our prayer request newsletter. While, uh, Thank while that's happening, absolutely, that he knew what we would need ahead of time in an and already provided. difficult life season. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you write. He is so faithful. To see my son, who had the world by the tail, lose all his dreams and start again with a huge deficit was something I never believed I would have the courage to face. Mm -hmm. Yet when tragedy strikes, we have no choice. The wonder is that grace is there. Mm -hmm. Always. How always. did God's grace manifest in the weeks and months that followed? In many, many, many ways. Uh, friends who were there to support us. Um, there are so many stories I could tell you about what happened. Um, a wonderful way it manifested itself to me is um, several months, perhaps a year or so after the accident, um, Glenn and I were ministering uh, in Ontario in a small uh, town, and the worship group was singing about the potter and the clay, which is something I love. And the Lord spoke to me very clearly that morning because I'd always thought that God was making my life into a vessel pleasing to Him, and I saw it as a vase. 
And he made me understand that morning that through John's accident, what he was doing for me, he was putting, molding a spout onto that vase. Mm -hmm. And he poured his love into my life in so many ways because he wanted to tip that vase and pour his love into the lives of other people. And this certainly is some of the fruit of that.